Hello everybody, this is Hammer Striker here. Today I've got the Daniel Defense H9. Please don't forget to check out our website. Go to our affiliates page. You'll find discount codes for things like Mantis X and Core Belts. Link to that cool little bore light that we use for lighting up the barrels. Use those links. It will often save you money, never will cost you any additional money, and helps the channel. And please consider supporting the channel on Player, formerly Utreon, where we can do some types of videos that are no longer allowed on YouTube. This is Daniel Defense's first handgun. They're really known for rifles, but not for, uh, for handguns. And it's based on the Hudson H9 design that they bought and made a bunch of improvements to. It's got a few interesting design features, low bore access, the recoil system is set up a little bit different, and the trigger is a bit different. It's also a metal gun, so it's an aluminum alloy frame, and of course a steel slide. So it's a little different than the polymer wonders that are popular right now, but it is relatively thin. So the slide comes in at 1.0 inches. It's a little thicker when you add the things that stick out like the slide stop slide release. But for a 15 round gun, that comes with three of these 15 round magazines, it's rather thin compared to something like a Glock 19 or something along those lines. So some of the dimensions of it, it's 7.69 inches front to back. The 1.0 inches at the slide, of course, as I mentioned, a little bit wider, and 5.12 inches tall. So it does fit into the rough size category of the compact series, Glock 19 and things like that. But when you consider the extended beaver tail and the slightly longer slide in overall body, it ends up being a little bit longer. And if you're curious about that and some comparisons to Hellcat Pro and some of the others that people are saying it's similar to, there's a comparison video we published earlier in the week. Check that out. It kind of goes through that. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to make this video long by doing that. It does seem to be a good quality construction. Uh, it does have replaceable grip panels similar to a 1911. And it does have no grip safety, so it isn't a 1911 design. And it does have the internal drop uh, safety piston and the inertial toggle. And you'll notice the inertial toggle is a little on the strange side. It comes up from the bottom and disappears. The toggle itself is really to prove to be irrelevant at the range. It went away just like any of the others, whether it's hinged at the bottom or hinged at the top. But if you saw our first, first look, you might have noticed that I, I mentioned the trigger seemed to be decent and that this wouldn't cause a problem, but that it being a straight back trigger like a 1911, it's a little on the heavier side. The brake is a little heavier. And I noticed that at you know working at it with it at the table and figured, well, a lot of times that kind of thing disappears at the range. It didn't. It actually became very prominent. And what I kind of noticed when I played around with it is most guns that have a typical hinge trigger where the hinge is at the top and the trigger curls out, whether it's a flatty or a curved trigger, you get your best trigger pull at the bottom because that's where all of your you know, leverage is. And when I pull this one at the bottom, it's heavier than if I pull it at the top or the center. So this trigger actually at the range turned out to be a little inconsistent and it was actually the trigger did make it more difficult to shoot this well because depending on where you landed on it and your your finger is going to kind of just from the overall design and angle of the gun it's going to tend to land there at the bottom oops i didn't suck it it's going to tend to you know you bring your finger in it's going to tend to land down near the bottom and you're going to get that heavier kind of less consistent pull and I did see others had that same observation, and when we had it at the range, we actually had one of the range officers, is a, a nice guy, we let him shoot this gun, he was interested in it, and he had the same observation. So I think straight back triggers work well on 1911s, but they work well because the brake is super light. As soon as you make a straight back trigger have a heavier brake, it starts to not be quite so good. Kind of similar to the CSX from Smith & Wesson. It has, from an ergonomic standpoint, it has some of the same features you see in common. Uh, front serrations, rear serrations, there's this little dip here, but it's be careful about using that because it tends to want to bite your fingers as it comes across. So if you're wanting to grab it from the front, don't grab here, grab on the slide serrations and it'll cycle quite nicely. Three slot Picatinny rail, nice extended trigger guard if you've got gloves magazine catch is reversible and the slide stop slide release is ambidextrous and both of them did seem to work well so functionally that worked well from a sights perspective it has a nice fiber optic front sight blackout rear and i'm not a fan of blackout rears but at least this one does have enough of a gap that you can pick up some of the target and try to center 
Well, one observation we had with this, and it was both of us shooting it as well as that range officer, it prints very low. So if you line the sights up properly, you would figure whether it's a 12 o'clock or a 6 o'clock hole, that does vary from gun to gun. It didn't matter. This was hitting an inch low on the target. You ended up having to do this and actually use the front base of the sight, line it up, and then you could get it on target. So the sights are not accurate on this, at least this one that's in my hand, and it's more than just me, so it's kind of everybody. Now the good news is it's optics ready, and for this gun it really you need to take advantage of that because if the sights are that way on all the guns, and of course that's not an adjustment available on the sights, you can cure that with an optic. Now you can replace the sights, you know, they're, they're drift replaceable, they're dovetail. And the other thing we noticed, out of the box, and it might be hard to show this on the camera, and I did not yet adjust it. The sight is drifted a little bit to the right. So I compensated for that at the range and I can fix that. But I would expect a gun to come out of the box aligned. This wasn't sitting on the shelf for an extended period of time. It came right out of the box. They went and got it from the back so it wasn't handled or dropped. Uh, and especially when you look, consider the price point. When you get to a price point of $12.99, which is the MSRP on this, it puts it in the same category as like the CZ Shadow 2, which is also an all-metal gun, optics ready. You kind of expect it to be right out of the box. comes with three magazines. That's nice at that price point. But some of the issues I've seen with the, the sighting system on it are not what I would expect from a gun in this territory. Interestingly enough, when you look at it, it looks bulky and kind of looks similar to like the new 5.7 when it comes to bulkiness and overall shape, shape of the grip and stuff like that. So it is a bulkier looking gun, but it is well balanced. So given its weight, it's a 29.6 ounce gun. Again, it's metal. You expect it to be a little heavier. It is well balanced. It fit well in the hand. It was comfortable to fire. The beaver tail kept the slide away from me. And from a reliability perspective, I had one functional issue with this. One time, the last round on a magazine failed to load. So you know, there was a stoppage. That happened once, didn't happen again during the session, and that could have been anything, you know, a brief break-in period, it could have been shooter error, it could have been weak ammo in the round before, because this is all range ammo. So I'm not going to count that against the gun. It did work. The trigger worked reliably, unlike some other guns with a similar trigger design. There is one thing I've got to call out, because it's unique, and it's not necessarily a good unique. In the manual, they call out two things that I thought were strange. One is you have to pull the trigger to disassemble it. That's not unusual. But typically a gun that you have to pull the trigger to disassemble is also dry fire safe. They specifically state that limited dry fire is okay, such as pulling the trigger to disassemble it or, you know, I'll, I'll do a couple trigger pulls to demo it. But any amount of extended dry fire, you have to use snap caps. So that makes this not suitable for dry fire practice based on that. Additionally, you have to replace parts on this at around 5,000 rounds. You have to replace the recoil spring, and there's the sear spring. When I get it apart, I'll show you the sear. Well, the recoil spring's easy. I mean, you take that out when you go to disassemble it. So anybody can replace that that can maintain the gun. But the sear, you know, that you're disassembling the fire control group at that point. That usually is beyond the skill set of the average gun owner that simply knows how to take it apart and clean it. I haven't seen any other gun out there that required internal functional springs, sear springs, to be replaced at the 5,000 round count or any count that you know they would mention as specifically as a maintenance item. That's a little strange, and I think that may impact some people's choice in choosing this gun. So now come for disassembly. So make sure it's clear. I'm going to use up one of my dry fire trigger pulls. And now to take it apart, you pull down these little tabs. There's one on this side, and there's one on that side couple things about them that I kind of don't like. They're relatively small. Well, Glock's similar. I mean, if you take a Glock, it's, it's about like that. But these have a curve on the end of them. They stick up a little bit, and they're metal. And that curve, I think, is meant to get it, make it easier to get hold of. But what that does is it bites into your finger. And they're fairly stiff. So you take it apart similar to a Glock, where you kind of take the tension off and pull down on these. But they're really heavy, and the travel is kind of odd. So it's unpleasant. My fingers now, you can see a depression in each of them, and it, it's unpleasant. It hurts a little bit. I mean, it's not searing pain. I'm in agony. I'm not going to be able to function for the rest of the day, but it's relatively unpleasant. And with that little hook on it, some of the pull things that you've seen for Glocks and stuff like that may not work. 
So let's talk about the frame. Of course, I mentioned it's an alloy frame, 7075 aluminum. Of course, the guides and things are steel, and you can see that the front and rear slide guides are very robust and very solid, and they're all steel in that part of it, and the fire control group is back here, and I believe that's the spring you have to replace, which means you have to disassemble the fire control group at 5,000 rounds to do that. And there was a question asked about this component here, this little piece here. That is steel. So there, there's no polymer in the fire control group or aluminum, at least in the exposed pieces that I can see. This is where the recoil assembly is a little different. You see this little tang and you see this recoil spring is kind of elevated. Well, actually, if, you know, if this were in the operating position like that, it would be effectively recessed. Instead of having the barrel increase, height increased to be able to put the recoil spring in line like a typical gun, what they've done is deepened the dust cover well to make room for it below. So I'm going to take it off and there's a little tang that sits here and it's got a little kind of a hook on it and that actually attaches to the barrel. When I pull the barrel out I'll show you but this is part of the design that reduces the bore access and this is kind of the one of the unique features of the H9 design. So I'll take the barrel out. There you can see right here the little recess that that hook sits into. You don't sit it all the way down on the bottom of the barrel, you actually put it in that hook. It's easy to get right, but you need to get it right for it to work correctly. The barrel is well, well machined. It's polygonal rifling, it's cold hammer forged. So it's a well done barrel. You can see the rifling is clean, no chatter. There's a bit of a recess, not quite a true crown because it's more of a shelf, but there is a bit of a recess and it has a nice machine polished feed ramp. And as I mentioned, other than that, that single stoppage, it did prove to be a reliable gun. The rest of it, if I were to hold it just like this and let's say put a Glock one next to it or any of the others, they really wouldn't be distinguishable from each other other than this is a little bit shallower than is typical. And of course you've got that hook at the front. Carrying on to the slide, very well machined. There's your drop safety piston there. Other than that, the, the slide looks pretty conventional. It doesn't look like any different from any other striker fired gun that's out there. Putting it back together is equally easy. Drop the barrel in, put the recoil spring in. You need to make sure that that little tang is facing down and get it lined up in that channel, which I'm gonna turn it so I can see it and then I'll show it to you put together. So I had to turn it so I could see it. It's not one like a Glock or the others that you can simply drop it in and you can feel it. You kind of have to see that you got it right. And then assuming I did that right, it should just slide right on. Of course, it'll slide right on if I get it lined up correctly. And you're operational again. So other than the cork of these being a little painful to operate, it is as easy to maintain as any of the others that are out there. Seems to be reliable, good quality machining and everything else. Really the only thing I've seen that significant to any average shooter is that the sights come out of the box not accurate from a height perspective. And in this particular one, you know, not left right. That's that's easy to fix. The height you can't. So what I'm gonna say is assuming all the others are like this, that this is not a one off from this one, if you buy this gun, plan to put an optic on it or plan to be aiming very high to hit where you're going, which of course that's a very bad practice to get in the habit of because you would then potentially carry that bad behavior over to other guns that you've got. So overall, I was a little bit less let down, a little bit disappointed in this. I don't know, knowing what I know now, having shot it, if I would drop 1299 on this again, there's some characteristics of it that are actually cool and nice. There's some other characteristics that I would expect in a $400 gun, not a $1,300 gun, and actually some bad behavior like the uh, sighting that I haven't even seen in $400 guns. At high points, the sights are accurate out of the box. So that kind of was a bit of a letdown for me. At least the optics ready helps solve that, but it's not what I expected. Beyond that, if you like our videos, please give us a thumbs up, share, subscribe, click that bell up there to be notified if you do. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Player, Rumble, we're pretty much everywhere. And thank you.